Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and you know, I've got to do so. Welcome everyone who's listening to this or watching it online, and you guys here. And uh, I really feel God's laid some up my heart. So I've entitled this this morning. I pray as mind the gap. Most of the verses should come up on the PowerPoint because um, a lot I've got to get through. So I'll do this one this morning and the next session I'll cover some other stuff. So as much as it's two parts, it'd be interesting. At least if you can't get here the next time, you get the CD or watch online. So I want to look at what happens when you pray about something but it doesn't seem to get answered. What do you do in those times when you're earnestly praying about something but nothing seems to be happening? I've been on courses and I've heard people pray and, and teach, should I say, that when we pray, God always answers three ways. He either says yes, he says no, or he says not now. My problem is that when I read the Bible, I don't see that as a basis to put a doctrine on. All I see is people praying and God answering, yes. Or God answering, let's work this through. And that's only what I read through a Bible. I mean, you may be able to point out different verses to me, and if you can, that'd be good, because that's where I've got to my study, where people pray in the Word of God, and God answers. But what do we do when we're praying about something, and we don't seem to see anything happening? And that's what I want to tackle. So I'm talking about minding the gap, the gap between the prayer and the receiving of the answer, whatever it might be. So this morning I'm going to look at healing, primarily because hey, I know a bit about that, but the principles can be applied to anything. So if you're struggling in a certain area or you're trying to battle way way through, the principles are going to be the same, but I'm going to use healing as a primary example so that if um, healing is something you need, then you can work your way through this. In James 5, verse 13 onwards, James asks three questions. He starts off by asking, is anybody in trouble? So I could say to you guys, is anybody in trouble? No, okay. <laughs> if you're in trouble, James tells us, let them pray. Did not It should come up. If anyone's in trouble, let them pray. The second question he asks, is anybody happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Anybody happy? Well, you're either going to be in one category or the other. You're either in trouble or you're happy, but you're not in trouble. So you've got to think. So either we're praying about the trouble we're in, or we're happy that we're not in trouble. And if you're not, if you're happy that you're not in trouble, or happy, let him sing songs of praise. But then he asks a third question. He says, "Is anybody sick?" Which is an interesting question to ask, because in the Greek, it's not saying, "Well." If anyone's in trouble, do this. If anyone's happy, let them do that. Is anyone sick, let... Is that just saying, if anyone's in trouble, let them pray. If anyone's happy, let them sing songs of it. <coughs> Is there anyone sick? James almost threw <coughs> across that somebody who's sick in the church was almost unheard of. <coughs> Is there anyone sick? Then if he are, and he carry on, <coughs> carries on. You know, in the church today, the question wouldn't be, is there anyone sick? The question would often be in many churches, is there anybody here well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anybody well? Yeah. So, I'm going to go through a few things now and tackle a few things now. Paul puts it this way in Philippines. When talking about praying, that might be where we're, we're through, thing, there it goes. In Philippines, it says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, uh, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the God of peace, who transcends all understanding, will guide your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So, if you are in trouble, you pray about it, and, and Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, don't be worried about anything, put it all before God. In every situation, pray with petition, but sometimes when you're praying and you're petitioning God, and there's not an answer coming, it can get a little bit awkward. So James asks these questions, is anyone sick? Now, do you know how many people were actually sick in the early church? That's an interesting question, isn't it? How many people were sick? Well, in Acts 5, we read this. Acts 5, verse 12, 6, 16, it said, The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting <coughs> regularly in the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. 
But no one dared join them, even though the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds, both men and women. As a result, the apostles were as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats, so that Peter's shadow should fall uh, might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. So the question I said earlier is, how many people were sick in the church? Well, according to this, there were no sick people in the church. No sick people in the church. Now, they didn't have an NHS. They didn't have aspirin, paracetamol. They just had people just getting on with life, and nobody was sick in the church. Because if more people sick in the church, he couldn't have said, all those who were sick outside the church who were coming got healed, but those in the church didn't get healed. It'd be a silly statement, wouldn't it? <coughs> but we're not sick people. So when we talk about sick, and when James says there's any sick amongst you, the word sick there means infirmed, it means weakness. So I can say that we're sick. If you've got back problems, <coughs> neck problems, joint problems, high problems, hearing problems, if you've got heart problems, if you've got sickness of the heart problems, if you've got mind problems or, or mental problems, it's covered in the word sick. Which would actually account to 99.9% .9 of the church could say, I've got one of those problems. But James says, if anyone's sick amongst you, and then it continues in what is going. Now, many people today don't realise what Jesus did on the cross. They don't realise everything he did. Now, most people say Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, and that's true. He did. But he did more than that on the cross. And I've talked about this before. If the Lamb of God, if Jesus was only there to take away the sins of the world, which we know he did, then why did he have to go through the beating he did? Because the Lamb in the Passover was a type or shadow of what Jesus would be, and that lamb just got its throat cut, bled out, and then they ate him. They didn't beat the living daylights out of the lamb with sticks into an inch of its life, then killed it. And yet Jesus was beaten into an inch of his life, and then he was hung on a cross. In Isaiah 53, it says this, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? And that's the question I have to ask. Who's believed the message? Because then he continues in verse 4. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. He's talking about, just, he can put these into terms, but he's talking about your sorrows, my sorrows. He carried our sorrows to the cross. What's making you sad, he carried to the cross. What makes us weak, our weaknesses, he carried to the cross. And it, it says, and we, we fought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. People looked at Jesus and thought, he's on there because of his own sins, but he didn't sin. So it was our stuff that he was carrying. Verse 5, he was, <laughs> but he was pierced for our rebellious, rebelliousness, rebelliousness, whatever that is. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole, and he was whipped so that we could be healed. It's a different translation, a new living translation, but it puts it across. That is, by his stripes we were healed. All of us have, like sheep, have gone astray, and we all left God's plan and followed our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. See, Jesus died on the cross, he took the sins of the world, but he took the sickness of the world, he took the sorrows of the world, he took the weakness of the world, and yet most people come to Jesus to get a ticket to heaven and say, I'm saved now, he's forgiven my sins, I'm all right. But not only did he forgive our sins, he took the guilt of that sin with him. He didn't just forgive us and take our sins so we could have a relationship with God. He took the guilt, he took the weaknesses, he took everything else. Paul tells us, about um, sick people in the church in Corinth later on concerning the communion, he says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and some have fallen asleep. So years after the Acts of the Apostles was going through Acts 5, nobody was sick in the church, but then as the church progressed into areas around, I don't know what was really going on, but by the time it reached Corinth, Paul had to write to them and say, actually, the reason why some people are sick it's because they're not recognising Jesus in the communion. They're not recognising everything Jesus did on the cross in the communion. That's why I often say to you, 
Focus on what he did for you and the fact that he's coming back. Remember his body broken for you. Remember his blood shed. There's two things there. Remember the forgiveness. Because most people say to me, Johnny, I, I don't expect God to heal me because they feel unworthy. But if you're forgiven and pardoned, you're no longer unworthy. If you've committed a crime and you go to court or, and you're pardoned of that crime, you don't go, okay, thank you for my pardon, but I'm off back to my cell. It's freedom. Woohoo! And I'll be a see you later in case they change your mind. But when it comes to God, we often think, yeah, God, thanks for uh, forgiving me. And that's it. But he says, by his blood we are forgiven, by his body beaten we are healed. And we are worthy. You're now children of God, a child of a king. Amen. You're not just somebody on this planet Earth trying to get by. You're now a prince or a princess. Yeah. Not gender confused. You're a male, you're a prince, and female, you're a princess. And as much as some guys might want to be a princess or act like princesses, <laughs> they're not. So today, what about us? We see God move in many ways and in many people. It's ironic that sometimes we hear testimonies, and I think it's amazing when you hear a testimony of what God's doing, but sometimes I ask the question, or I have asked the question, God, why? Why are you doing it for them and not for somebody else? And you might ask that question, God, God, I believe you and I've got faith, but why have you done that for them and not for me? Are they special or am I not worthy? So what's the situation? Now I know God heals in lots of ways. In the, in the Bible, it teaches you can stand on the word of God. That's what I have to do. I get a verse from the Bible. I stand there and say, God, by your stripes, I'm healed. Body, by your stripes, I am healed. And I walk in that. Some people, you know, they've, they've got the gift of healing and they come over as, uh, with a great faith. And it's not down to the person's faith. It's down to their faith. And they lay hands on the sick and they get up. Smith Wigglesworth or somebody operate out. There's other people who just get healed. It's almost like out of the blue. I remember reading a story of a lady in Wakefield. She was blind and walked into a church. She'd been there for, you know, uh, some time. And she's in the middle of worship. And it was so, opened the eyes of my heart, Lord. And but suddenly she could see. So God opened the eyes and the heart. You know, like, miracle. So God uses different things. He, he, he said he sent his word and healed them. He speaks promises. And these are all things that we can tap into. So back to uh, James. James... 5 and verse 14, he said, If anyone's sick amongst you, let him call upon the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And this is interesting. I've seen some anointments going on and some oiling down of people. But it's not about the amount of oil that you get put on your head. It's just about the fact it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And verse 15 says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. I don't know if you notice there, if you look up there, it just says, and the prayer offered in faith will. Yeah. It will. It's not, it might. It will. Yeah. Will make the sick person well. And the Lord will rise him up, raise him up. And if he has sinned, they will be forgiven. Amen. Now, I'm not saying all sicknesses is because of sin, but sin can often open a door in our lives for sickness. Now, as much as we're forgiven, if we're not tapping into the fact that we're forgiven, that we're walking under the blessings of God, and we keep going into certain areas and committing certain sins, and you get sick, then sometimes there was a door opened. There's lots of sicknesses that are due direct from sickness, and the Bible actually does teach us and tell us that there's certain sins that actually, when you commit them, are sinning against your own body. Sexual sins in particular, you sin against your own body. So... Not all sin leads to sickness, and not all sicknesses are because of sin, but it can be. But we'll look at that probably next time. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray to each other that you may be healed. I love James because Paul's talking to the churches and James is talking to the people in the churches. And James don't look around. We've looked at this before. James, this is a brother of Jesus, his, his uh, next brother down. And uh, he knew Jesus growing up and he didn't really like him and tried to take charge of him. But obviously he got saved at some point, became a leader in the church. And he wrote this and he doesn't mix his punches. If you, ever wanna, if you really want to get encouraged, read the book of James. And then start repenting. 
I'm wondering what's going on. I'll read it again and do it again. You know, it's kind of punching in the face. It's not Romans 8, is it? God loves us and unconditional, all that. It's not a real blessing. James just slaps you around the face a few times and tells you to get over it. And he says, therefore confess your sins. The word confess there means to speak them out. Now, I don't want you telling me all your sins. But in principle, what it's talking about here is not that we sit in a booth and you come and confess your sins. It's saying that, guys, I've messed up in this area. Please pray for me. And it says this, pray for each other so that you may be healed. Pray for one another. On the one hand, come to the elders. But on the other hand, talk to each other. And the word confess often means to agree and to say the same as. To say the same as. If you look at 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, Conf- uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. The word confess says, homo logio, which means to say the same as what God says about your sin. What's God say about your sin? It's on the cross. Yeah. What's God say about your forgiveness? It's already happened. What's God saying about the condition of your heart? Before God, you're perfect. Yeah. Not because your condition of your spirit. You're perfect and blameless. He says, therefore, confess your sins. <sighs> And <laughs> your sins to each other. Like I said, you have to go run through them. Guys, I'm not. You know, if you've nicked the last piece of cake in there, I need to know. <laughs> Especially if I've not had one. <laughs> but I don't need to know your internet browsing history. <laughs> if that's a problem to you. you know? <laughs> and it says this the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do we have any righteous people in here? There's a lot of, um, I think I am. Okay, if you think you are, or think you aren't, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in Christ. So you are a righteous person. So back into James a little bit, it says the prayer of a righteous person, your prayer, is powerful and effective. Amen. So the gap between the prayer and receiving, you can stand in that gap and pray as a righteous person with power and effectiveness. You can pray with power and be effective because you're a righteous person. I like what the King James says. It says, the, um, oh, put that next bit up, where are we? That's it. The effective, fervent prayer. I'm not quite sure what that really means, but it sounded good, doesn't it? That's no king. Effective, fervent prayer. I like the word earnest, which is the the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That's the the New Living Translation. I I like that version. So the earnest prayers, your prayers of a righteous person have great power. 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says this, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. So if your prayers are powerful and effective, and that you are a righteous person, keep with me on this one, and the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, you, and his ears are open to our prayers, question, do you think he's listening to you? Yes. And do you think he answers you? Yes. God is not like dad around the pool on holiday when the sun's going by and he used to do this. Dad, 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 what? And jump into the water. God's eyes are upon you. Now, I do get it. Okay, I do get it. Some of you look at me and go, Johnny, you know, God's going to watch you all the time. I think that's because he's just keeping an eye on me. But he watches you all the time because he can't take his eyes off you. I'm the little one who needs to watch you go, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but maybe you're the one where he just goes, I can't believe you, look at you. Look at you guys. You're on the ass that you claim that one. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are, are open to your prayers. This is what we're looking at. That God looks at us. See, I believe that God heals. I believe God heals instantly. I believe in the power of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the laying on of hands. But I also know that God teaches that sometimes things take a while. And I've often questioned why. Because in my Pentecostal, charismatic upbringing, 
All I saw was sick person walk in, slap hands on them, shabba dabba doo, shabba dabba doo, <laughs> up from the gravy rose, and out they went running. <laughs> now, there was a time when I prayed for somebody. I'm, I'm in the middle of leading some worship. Yeah, I used to do that. And God said, go pray for this person. This person being carried in. Two people carrying stuff down. <coughs> so I'm, I'm full of Holy Spirit. I'm full of faith. And I walked over. I dragged the guest speaker off the platform with me. We're going to go pray for that sick person because God's going to raise him up. And he went white. But quite encouraging for me, isn't it? <laughs> so I walked out and said, in the name of Jesus, stand up. And I grabbed her, stood up, and she screamed in pain and fell back into a chair. Oh. <laughs> I did not expect that. So I straight away... Run away. No, I didn't. <laughs> I just thought, God, what's going on? You've said, God, you spoke. You said, when she walked in, God said she's going to be healed. In the worship, God said, it's time to pray for her. I said, God, you've told me she's going to get healed. God, you've told me it's time, it's now. So I closed my eyes and said, Lord, what's going on? And I saw a picture in my mind of claws in her back. Now, not everything is like this, but we'll look at this later at the next session. But it were like claws were in her back. And I rebuked the claws and I set her free from this oppression. And I looked in her eyes and said, Jesus heals you right now. Now stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. And she bounced out of that seat, jumped into the aisle, touched the toes. I mean, most of us couldn't touch our toes, really, could we? She went down, touched her, stood up and fell out in the spirit. And she lay there for the rest of the meeting. But what happened? I prayed. Nothing happened. And it's usually in that time when nothing seems to or the opposite seems to happen. Mm -hmm. That we back off. Yeah. That we, oh, 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 whoa, whoa, maybe I heard wrong. Maybe something's amiss here. Mm -hmm. And it's the same when praying for anything in our lives. When you pray, you need to continue trusting in God in those times. Mm -hmm. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. Sometimes we need to walk through something. And I think God is more interested in our relationship with him than the gifts that he's going to give us. Yeah. God is more interested in building the relationship. I mean, I've often questioned this. Why do non-Christians and new Christians get healed pretty fast? Mm. And God says, because they have no relationship with me. And they have no hang-ups. They have no theology of why God doesn't. They just accept it all and get on with it. But as we grow in God, God wants us to have a relationship with him. In fact, believe it or not, he wants you to get to a point in your life where you're not walking in constant one sickness to the next sickness to the sick next sickness. When you walk in, in the blessings of God, so sicknesses don't really have an effect on you because you're trusting in the word of God. And I, I know some people take that into a real far place. <coughs> But a lady says to me this week, have you got your flu jab? I said, why would I need that? I said, do I look old? She says, no, but everybody, you know, I remember you used to get asthma when you were a kid. I thought, yes, I did. Therefore, you can have a flu jab. I went, flu bounces off me. I said, when was the last time you saw me with a raving cold, flu or anything? When did you see me with anything like that? And she says, Johnny, I've never known you sick. I said, I can tell you exactly. 20 odd years ago, the last time I had an infection in my ear, and I knew that that was a bad one, and I'm laid out there. Now, do I have other problems? I do. But when it comes to sicknesses coming on to me, I just stand against them. I've told you this, and people laugh at me, that when I, go, when I sneeze, I go, oh, antibodies. Antibodies, do what you were created to do, seek and kill. Get on there and kill them all. I do. And people think I'm crazy, but I'm not the one snotting. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor can't come to the healing meeting because he's sick. <laughs> you think I'm mad? Try it. <laughs> You're good. Somebody's going to go, mm, I've tried that probably. <laughs> I've got things on this sort of So the earnest prayers of a righteous person are great, have great power and produce wonderful results. I love that. <coughs> then he continues back to James 5, verse 17. So in the context of praying and healing, he said, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, would you compare yourself with Elijah? No! <laughs> Elijah! Elijah! 
is other. But James says, look at Elijah as an example to you. Now, Elijah had the Holy Spirit upon him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit would, could leave Elijah. The Holy Spirit has promised he'll never leave us. So in one thing, he was looking forward to what we have. Moses was looking forward to what we have. And we're going, we're not worth it. But he said, look at Elijah. Elijah, sorry. James tells us that Elijah is an example to us about Ernie's prayer. Now, the last time I checked Elijah's life, everything seems to happen straight away for him. But according to um, James, he said, look at him in regards to Ernie's prayer. So, shall we? Look at him. Kings. 1 Kings, Eli, uh, 1 Kings 17. It says this. Uh, there we are, it's there. And Elijah, the, the guy from there, the inhabitants of that place, <laughs> said to Ahab, who happened to be king, so this is Elijah just pops on the scene. He's yeah. no history, he just pops up. Oh, here I am. And he says to the king, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain three years except by my word. I mean, that's a pretty bold statement, is that, isn't it? That's like in your face, king. Yeah. But he says this, the Lord God of Israel before whom I stand. He had a relationship with God that gave him a boldness, that gave him a tenacity, that gave him a bit of bite, where he could go to the ruling power and say, it ain't gonna rain in this place again. I mean, it's like somebody walking up to the Prime Minister or somebody in Parliament going, this is what's gonna happen. I've changed mind about the Christmas meal, by the way, Phil. We're, gonna have, we're not going to have a Christmas meal. We're going to have a Brexit meal. Oh, <laughs> it's, the same as a Christian, it's the same as a Christian meal, but we have the Brussels. <laughs> I had to put that one in, didn't I? <laughs> So Elijah says, before who I stand, I'm going to stand there, and there's not going to be any dew or rain. Then jump over to 1 Kings 18, and it says this, It came to pass that after many days, the three and a half years, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year of the drought, saying, Go present yourself to Hayab, and I will send rain on the earth. So he's had a word from God, so he's gone to Ahab, and he's spoken the word. It's not going to rain. Three and a half years later, I'll give or take a little bit, he then goes, God says to him, Elijah, get up, go see the king. Now, he's been hiding as Elijah, because the king's been trying to kill him. So he says, go see the king and tell him, present yourself before Ahab, and I will send rain. So he's got a word from God now, haven't he? I mean, most charismatic Pentecostals will just take the word and run with it. We're out of here, we're gone. So he goes to Elijah, sorry, Elijah goes, and to tell the king, it's basically it's going to be raining. So he had a word from God. So after he's done all that killing the prophets and the veil and the fire coming down, you get to 1 Kings 18 and verse 41. And it says this, Then Elijah said to him, Get up and eat, for there is a sound of abundant rain. So run with me on this one. First of all, there's going to be no rain until I say so. That's what it said, isn't it? Then he says, God says to him, go see him because it's going to rain. So when Elijah goes to the king, basically says, get ready, it's going to rain. Now he's saying to him, Elijah says to him, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundant rain. Now, if you read the story, there was no rain. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. But it's raining. It was thinking of the song now, yeah. <laughs> But there was no rain, there wasn't a sound of rain, but Elijah could see and he could hear something in the spirit was coming. But there was nothing happening. So he had a word from God, he spoke the word of God, and then what did he do? It says, so Arab went up, he ate and drank, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. He went up to pray. I just think he knelt down and put his face in his knees. I don't think he was head between his legs or all like that. But he went up to pray. Question. If you, if you had a word from God, and you spoke the word of God, 
would you see the necessity to go and pray? And yet Elijah did. And James says, look at Elijah as an example for earnest prayer concerning healing. I'm tying these two things together. So, remember what we read earlier. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. And he earnestly prayed that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. And then again, he prayed. And the heavens gave rain and produced their crop. So he went on the mountaintop and he prayed. But then we, we read on. And then I'll just make sure I've not skipped a little bit. I think uh, no, we're on this page. And uh, it says, back to uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 30, 43 this time. Then he said to his servant, go look towards the sea. And the servant went and looked and returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. So he's had a word from God. He spoke, there is going to be rain. It's coming. But his, his servant says, I don't see how. If you prayed for somebody... He said, believe and trust God. How are you doing? No, it's no better. It's no better. I feel as bad as what I did two minutes ago. In fact, now I feel worse. Because God's... Uh, and they're going to this whole drama about the fact that why has God not done it? That's why some people don't come up for healing. It's because if they don't get the healing, it makes them feel worse. Yet James says, if you are sick, call. You don't say, I just says, call the elders of the church. So anyway, seven times Elijah told him to go back and look. And finally, on the seventh time, his servant came back and said, I saw a cloud about the side of a man's head rising from the sea. Seven times, I, I don't see how, go back. Don't see how, come back. Don't see anything, go back. I mean, this guy's praying seven times. Or at least seven times. And I, pray. I don't think he's screaming at God, going, why? Why, God? I think he's saying, God, you've promised You've said, God, I'm reminding you of your word. You've told me it's going to rain. I'm speaking out, it's going to rain. And the servant of man of no faith is going, I don't see how. And then he says, well, well. It's like when you pray to somebody who's paralysed and you go, what's going on? He goes, well, I can feel my little toe. Sometimes I just want to flip the little toe. Let's <laughs> well, see how far you can feel that thing. You know what I mean? Ah, yeah, yeah, I can feel that. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah was praying, believing and believing God, trusting God and praying in agreement with God about God's word. That's why we need to know the word of God so we can pray the word of God. And as soon as he said, I see, I see a, a cloud rising like an ant, he was off. Woohoo! I mean, some of us will be going, uh, I'll, I'll pray again. It's interesting, though, because I, I, I mean, I agree. I, I come from a school of. Uh, uh, a background where we used to see pray for people, miracles if it didn't happen we kind of blame them blame us maybe it's someone lined up with the moon properly, I don't know what it was maybe there were a demon in the building maybe it was some. but when it happened it was like we forgot all that stuff and just praise God but yeah maybe sometimes we need to be earnestly praying now, I don't mean saying, God, why have you not? But praying, God, you have said. Yeah. You have said. Yeah. You see, this is me with God. You know, if I took you out for a meal and offered to pay, now that would be rare, but if I did, <laughs> and I said, I'm going to pay, and, and you know, come, come with me, I'm paying, I'm going to pay, I am paying. I've got the money, I'm paying. And we sat down, we scoffed his faces, and you had the biggest steak going because I was paying. And you sat there, and at the end of the meal, it's time to go. And I went, right, I'll see you later. Hang on a minute. You, you wouldn't sit there going, uh, I hope I've got my card with me. Most of you say, hang on a minute, Johnny. You said you're going to pay. Hang on a minute, Johnny. You told us. You promised us you'd pay. And you did, you'd have an expectation of me paying that bill, wouldn't you? Yeah. You would. And yet Jesus has promised us so much, and we don't have that expectation because we feel unworthy of the promise that God's promised us. As if we can make any difference. Once you get past the idea that you're not worth anything at all outside Jesus. But in Jesus you're a valuable, amazing, awesome person. With all the rights and privileges of a prince or princess that stands before the king. That you can actually have an expectation that the promises that are in the word of God, when you fulfil the 
obligation on most of his promises that you will receive the promise. All God's promises are yes and amen, most of them are conditional, but you've got to have that. Salvation is non-conditional, it's just trusting. There's a guy called John G. Lake, I like him, I love reading about it. A lot of this stuff I've, I've got from some of his stuff and other people. But he had this school of ministry. He had a school of evangelists. And he used to teach him how to pray for people to be sick. Oh, oh we're sick, sorry. Oh, to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the 1920s, 1930s in the US where medicine wasn't brilliant. And people used to come to his school and be taught how to lay hands on the sick. And then he'd say this. We've had a phone call from, let's say, from Bradford, if it were over here. And I want you to go over to Bradford, because remember, there weren't many cars around in those days. I want you to go to Bradford, and I want you to pray for that person, and you're going to raise them up, and you're going to see God heal them. That sounds good, doesn't it? And then he'd say, if they don't get healed, don't come back. Would you go? Over 90% of the people that he sent out came back. And some of them, because John actually says that sometimes they had to pray for two to two and a half weeks for people, earnestly praying for people to be raised up. And they were. People on deathbeds who should have died. And for two weeks he'd pray for them. And they'd be still alive. And he'd keep praying. And he'd keep praying. And he taught his students to keep praying. Earnestly praying. God's word said this. God's word says this. God's promises. God, you're a great God. You're an amazing God. And some of them happened instantly. Some, it took a couple of weeks. So when he said in James about earnestly praying, sometimes we need to engage in the fact that we need to be earnestly praying. If you remember Daniel, I think it's in... Um, Daniel 9, he prayed for three minutes, thereabouts, give or take. And an angel pops up. Ding, I'm here. The next chapter, he had to pray for three weeks before the angel popped up. What's going on? Well, there's a lot of theology in that, but the truth is, he had to pray. But are we giving up after two minutes, ten minutes, five minutes, eight days, six days, whatever? Are you giving up from earnestly praying because we've not seen it, because we're not seeing what it is? Or are we just trusting in God? Jesus is more interested in our relationship with him than he is the gifts he can give us. And in that prayer time is when you're building the relationship up. If you, read, if you remember in the, um, in the Gospels, they talk about a demon-possessed person and, and he didn't come out and Jesus came up and said, get out, and it went out and the disciples said, why didn't this happen? And he said to Jesus, this spirit, sometimes this spirit's got to come out with prayer and fasting. So everybody's thinking, that means if there's a demon-possessed person, we've got to go away, pray and fast, and then come back and cast it out. But that's not what he's saying. He's going, I live a life of praying and fasting. So when I walk into this room, the demons flee. But you guys are not living, not you guys, the disciples, are not living a lifestyle of praying and fasting. So when you come to this situation, you have no power. And you've got, you know, you've got people of little faith. So I'm suggesting those times of praying earnestly for, for however long it is, is a time where we're sharpening the sword, we're repairing our shield of faith, we're standing on the word of God, and we're preparing ourselves. You see, I believe that God wants us to prepare to heal the sick before there's a sick person that needs healing. But often we respond because of something instead of preparing for when it happens. Now, I know sometimes most people, and I, you know, don't put your hands up, but most people are preparing for worst in life. Mm. You know, as they're getting older, well, I better get a stair lift in. Why don't you just pray about it? Mm. Get a bungalow or get your legs healed, whichever way it's going to be. But people are preparing for the worst, and God's telling us to prepare for the worst in other people and live the best for us. Mm. And start getting ourselves in a place where we listen to the Holy Spirit more and more. I'm kind of embarrassed. I went to a conference this week. I had a great time. But I had an encounter with God, but not at the conference. I'm driving down to the conference. It's like six o'clock in the morning. I decided I want a cup of tea. That's a polite way of saying I need in the loo. So I nips to the loo. And so I locked myself in a little booth there. And the Holy Spirit turned up. <laughs> I'm sat there. And God turned up. And it's like... <gasps> God, you're here! In the loo! 
<laughs> on the M6. God turned up. I guess my Bible out. I'm reading bits, and God's presence is uh, in the toilets at uh, services on the M6. That was more of an encounter than every conference I went to. But it was amazing. Why? Because I just spent two hours going around Manchester and down the M6 just talking to God. Not whining at him, complaining. I, would ask, I, I often do it. I said, God, how are you doing? How are you doing? I was like, I was a planet going. I think sometimes it says, you know, planet's doing all right, but my kids are messing it up. You know what I mean? You know, it talks in, in the Psalms about how Israel limited God by their unbelief. It talks about how Jesus couldn't do amazing miracles because of their unbelief. And maybe one of the reasons we're not seeing everything happen in our lives is because when we're in the gap, between the praying and receiving, we're allowing unbelief, doubt, to come in there. I'll just spend a couple of minutes, I'll cut this short and I'll carry on later on. You know, this is all in the context of praying for each other that we may be healed. Praying for one another that we may be healed. You know, we need to pray earnestly for one another. Sometimes it's an immediate, let's pray for you now. But then say, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to see things happen. Mark 11, 23. It says this, um, NIV version. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourselves into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he has said will happen, it will be done for them. He says it. I got into trouble once. Someone said, are you saying this? Because I'm not saying anything. I'm just reading the verse. Mm -hmm. Now your mountain in your life might be oppression. It might be a sickness. It might be a problem. It might be some at work. It might be whatever it might be. But if anyone says to the mountain, see often we're telling God about our problems and God's going, I know about your problems. Start speaking to it yourself. Yeah. Start telling the problem what my word says and start acting upon it. But it says, and does not doubt in his heart. And I think that between the gap of praying and receiving, we need to guard our hearts so that doubt doesn't, in, doesn't come into that area. That we don't allow fear. I think the reason why Peter started to sink, and that does make me laugh when he got out of the boat and started walking on the sea, he said he saw the wind and the waves. I mean, if it were perfectly flat, do you think he could walk on it? The wind and the waves had nothing to do with the fact that he was walking on the water. The problem was, he saw the wind and the waves, start to doubt the fact, why the heck am I doing this? Doubt entered up, unbelief kicked in, and it's not that he didn't have faith, it's just his, un his unbelief overruled his faith and he began to sink. And I still think that's funny. He began to sink. Now the last time I trod on water, I sank. <laughs> you know, my woman at me, it's like a cartoon. I'm gone. You walk on ice and it suddenly gives way, you've gone. It's not a big game. You know, it's like, oh, 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 I'm sinking. You just go. But we need to trust in God and not allow doubt to come in. Therefore, I tell you, whoever asks, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. Pray, believe, then you get it. But the then you get it could be a minute, a week, a month. It's kind of really sharpened up my own prayer life because I've been praying for things and sulking with God because I've not got them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Don't you love me anymore? You know, we never have those paddy moments. <laughs> I have them. I must admit, I do have them every now and then. It happens. I have those moments where I, I'm laid there, I'm in a great time with God and then, then the devil whispers, yeah, but you prayed this and it's not happened. And I start saying, yeah, it's not happened yet. But it's in the bank. Amen. I'm trusting it. Yeah. I'm going to see it. I started rephrasing it, reworking it. And I tell you that whatever you ask for, it doesn't say, which is often what's said, whatever you ask for, you've got to take it in with one verse of the Bible. But, you know, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have it and you will receive it. I love that. I believe it. I'm receiving it. So the gap between praying and receiving, we need to make sure that there's no doubt. We need to stand in that gap with confidence and the word of God and start claiming what God's promised us with an assurance that he's going to do it. You see, James says to us, look to Elijah, 
But Paul often said, look to Abraham. So on the one hand, he says, look to Elijah, and that's a great story. But Paul often said, look to Abraham. If you go to Romans 4, verse 18 onwards, talking about Abraham, he says, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Now, most of you know the story. He couldn't have kids as well. His wife couldn't have kids. He was an old man. You know, and they didn't have Viagra in those days, and God just had to do a miracle with both of them. I mean, imagine this, she's 90. I mean, you might be a pretty good-looking person when you're in your 20s. It kind of goes down all there after, doesn't it? That's why you need to fall in love when you're in your 20s, folks, because then you see past the outward. <laughs> see the heart. I better dig myself out of that hole if you want to So... Uh, he became a father of the earth just as it had been said to him. He held up to the promise from the word of God, so shall your offspring be. Without uh, weakening in his face, in the faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Don't deny the problems. Don't deny the facts. But acknowledge the truths. Facts are facts. They're there. You've lost your job. I've not lost my job. I've not lost your job. No, it's a fact you've lost your job. But acknowledge the truth that God might have something better for you in the future. Without weakening in his face, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, he got it pretty good there. And Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He didn't allow doubt and unbelief to come in. He stood in faith. Faith and doubt can run parallel. You know that, don't you? Faith and unbelief, belief and unbelief can run parallel. You know, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And you've got to choose, am I going to listen to the doubts or am I going to listen to the facts, of, sorry, the truth of the word of God? And he says, but he was strengthened in his faith. Whoa, things are not going so good. But he was strengthened in it. The longer it took, he just got stronger and stronger in his faith. But let's face it, if something that happened after three days, most of us... I've forgot about him, packed in and gone somewhere else. And yet, years it took this, not weeks, 20 odd years. And he said, he was strengthening his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do all that he promised. He was fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded about the word of God? Are you fully persuaded that God who has promised is able to do what he promised he'd do. It's not like a parent, my dad used to promise me all sorts, and half of them I never got, and other half he took back. But God says that if he promises it, he promises it. That's it. Are you persuaded like Abraham that he has a power? Philippines, we read this early, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Many people are praying, hoping God might do something. They pray, hoping. Instead of praying in faith, standing in the gap and saying, God, it's not happened today. I thank God. I, I sometimes ask God, how was that situation going on, God? I could do with it soon. I know you're working it out, but how's it going? Because you've said to me, God, this, and I'm believing and trusting you. How's it going? I remind him. Kids don't have a problem with that. If you've told a kid you're going to give them some sweets, they're going to remind you every 10 minutes till they get them. They're not bothered. They'll keep going at you and at you and at you. And eventually you say, shut up and just give them sweets. <laughs> we are children of God. Amen. And we're not there to annoy God. But I think God loves it when we remind him what he said. Yes. When we tell him what he said. We need to pray standing on the promise of his word. Yes. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do everything. Very promised. And one more verse and I'm packing it in because I've gone over a little bit. You see, I stand on some verses in the Bible. There's many that I stand on and there's loads that I love. And I've just put some on Rock Church uh, about different verses. But one of the verses that I stand on is Psalm 103. Psalm 103 says this. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and in my inmost beings, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and not forget his benefits. My job... Our job, or put it back to me, my job is to praise the Lord with all my soul in my innermost beings, keep praising and thanking him. That's my job. 
and not forgetting everything he's promised, his benefits. That's my job. Now, let's look at God's job. This is for me. Who forgets all my sins, all your sins, all my, heals all my diseases and redeems my life from the pit and crowns my life with love and compassion and satisfies my desires with good things that my youth is renewed like eagle. I personalise that one. That's God's promises to me. My job is to praise him, thank him, and trust him, and don't forget his benefits, is, is to give me the benefits. You see the two sides of this? So I praise and thank him, and I trust him. That's why I don't get sick, because he heals all my diseases. That's why I'm not going to go to the pit of hell, because he's going to rise me up, I'm going to go to heaven. But he has crowned me with love and compassion. That's an interesting one. God's expanding my heart. I'm kind of getting a bit crazy and, and finding I've got compassion for people I never would have. And God's just giving me compassion for them. And he satisfies our desires with good things. Amen. I've got some pretty good desires. I have. But my desires are aligned up with his desires. And I'm seeing the desires of my heart being fulfilled. That my youth is renewed like an eagle. I'm not on Red Bull. I'm not on tablets. I'm just sometimes when I get preaching, I get happy. I just want to bounce around. And I just get happy. And I think sometimes I'm like a five year old. But my youth has been renewed like the eagles. Now, I don't really understand that whole concept, but it sounds pretty good. But I'm going to be as energized as anything. I know that as we get old, we're supposed to get old and we're supposed to, everything's supposed to pack in. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible said we can be young and vibrant. Do you think when God touched Sarah's life, and opened up her womb, I believe that God gave something to Sarah that just didn't affect her womb, it affected her face <laughs> and her body. He says you'd be daughters of Sarah, yeah. trusting in God. I don't think women want to be look like a 90 year old grandmother, a 99 whatever. They want to look like someone who's young and vibrant. And I think that truly that God gave something not just in her womb, but I mean, Abraham, he must look one day, whoa, baby. <laughs> If something's got to happen in Abraham's life, you know what's got to happen. He's got to look at somebody and go, whoa. He trusted God and he didn't change. He knew God was going to do something. And one day he looked at his wife and he knew God had done something. And then later on Isaac came along. Have you never read this stuff in my life? I mean, imagine Sarah going to a toddler group. Is, it, is this your grandkid? Is it your grand, great grand? God just did something. Why was... Think about this. Why did kings want to marry her? I mean, nobody wanted to marry my grand. So she must have had something about her. But he trusted God. Now, he satisfies our desires with good things. And he renews our youth like eagle. You know, as you get older, you should get wiser, but you should still have that passion and fire. Yeah. You know, it should be something going on on the inside. And eventually it shines on the outside. Yeah. Therefore, I say unto, this is a King James version, literally King James. Therefore, I say unto you, the things soever ye desire, ye pray, because that ye receive them, you shall have them. But it's the word, whatever things you so desire, when you pray, when you pray, what do I desire? All my needs, God has already got lined up for me. His word has promised that he will supply all my needs. All my needs. Then he talks about our desires. What do we want? Now you need to line your desires up with what God's got for you. And see God move. Do you think that we should stand in the gap between the prayer, sorry, do you, yeah, that's the question here. Do you think we should stand in the gap between the prayer and the receiving? Well, I do. Standing in the gap, standing on the promises, standing as children of the King, standing as righteous and holy people, praising and thanking him, not forgetting his benefits, and being fully persuaded that what he has the power to do what he said. The battlefield is in the mind. And I'm going to stop yeah. this. Amen. Yeah. And when you pray, the first thing is the devil's going to say, did God really say? did he say? And you've got to go, God has said. Amen. 
And tomorrow, God has said. And the day after, God has said. And keep going, God has said. And not forgetting his benefits, but praising him all the way. And then let God do what God does, and we do what we do. Amen. I'm going to carry on tonight, or next time, with what we're going on about. So that's part one. That would be intense, wouldn't it? But you did laugh. So that's good. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can stand on all your promises, Lord. We can stand trusting in you, knowing, Lord, that what you promise, you have the power to do what you said you will do. Lord, you've got a full book of promises and fulfillments, Lord, that you're never shortchanging anybody, but you're standing by them, Lord. And I thank you that everyone in the sound of my voice can receive everything that you've got for us. Lord God, I pray that you continue to, to work through Lord, your promise in our life and help us to pray fervently for one another, standing with one another, being there yeah. together. Lord, knowing, Lord, that your relation, our relation with you is more important to you than even to us. Lord, I pray that you will just continue to speak to our hearts, that you will change our lives, that we'll become more like you, giving glory to you all the time for all the great things you've done. Amen. Amen. Amen.